Welcome to the Year of Elections, the premier series of N-Opinion, a new podcast brought to you by the Opinion Desk at The National. I'm Suleiman Hakimi, The National's Opinion Editor, speaking to you from our studio here in Abu Dhabi. And in this series, I'll be joined by a series of experts to take you through the votes that are shaping the world. Our episode this week is on Indonesia, a nation of 280 million people, the world's largest Muslim-majority country, and its third largest democracy. With nearly half of the population under the age of 30, the country is brimming with potential. It is expected to be the planet's sixth largest economy in just three years' time. President Joko Widodo, popularly known as Jokowi, has put in place grand plans to move the country's capital from Kramp Jakarta to a new city on the island of Borneo. He has also pledged to make Indonesia a member of the OECD, a club of developed countries, and one of the top five economies by 2045. But Jokowi's time in office, capped by a term limit of 10 years, is coming to an end. Vying to take his place are a former military general, an ex-academic, and a former governor who is a self-styled man of the people. The country's election is scheduled for February 14, when most of its 200 million eligible voters will go to the polls in what is the world's largest single-day election. Joining me from Singapore is Monica Wiharja, who was formerly an economist for the World Bank in Jakarta and is now a visiting fellow at the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute and an adjunct assistant professor at the National University of Singapore. We're also joined from Kuala Lumpur by Sholto Burns, who is the National's longtime East Asian Affairs columnist and was formerly a senior fellow at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies in Malaysia. Sholta, we'll start with you. One of the things that uh, President Widodo has been credited with most on the world stage is towing a fine line in Indonesia's relationships with America and China. Could you just tell us a little bit about Indonesia's place in the world? Yes, I sometimes think of it as being a bit of a sleeping giant at the moment, given its large population and potential for growth. I think that this is one of the issues going into this election, is that the presidency, we'll just stick with that to begin with, it's a five-year term. Whoever wins is going to almost certainly want to try and win a second term. So whoever wins could be setting the direction of Indonesia over the next 10 years. It's a young population. Over 50% of of the uh, voters are under 40. So that's the kind of situation where you want to make sure that you get a demographic dividend and not a demographic um, deficit. There are huge ambitions going forward, including, I think, to be the the world's fourth largest economy by 2045. If you look at any of the the predictions that are done by PwC and and other companies about where the world will be in 2050 or 2100, Indonesia's up there near the top. So it's really whoever comes to power, are they going to manage to harness the potential that they have? over that next sort of 10 years. So that's at home. It's also then a question of whether Indonesia will step up a bit more um, internationally. I'm not criticizing it for not doing more um, than it has done recently, but there's very much the potential for it to be a real leader in ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is about 670 million people, 10 countries. And Every country in Southeast Asia, apart from East Timor at the moment, in fact, ASEAN needs more direction. Indonesia has seen itself as a leader of ASEAN in the past. So that's one possibility for the country's new leadership. When we're going forward, we might also think, be thinking about the UN finally has to be reformed at some point. Will Indonesia be pushing for a, a permanent place on the Security Council in some kind of reformed UN at some point? And it's also going to be very important in terms of dealing with relations with China and in the South China Sea, where there are competing claims for Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Brunei, uh, Malaysia, China, and um, Taiwan actually has separate um, claims as well. Uh, Even though, of course, China doesn't consider it to be um, a separate country, it's a renegade province. So there's lots of potential and there's lots of questions really about um, where um, Indonesia will will be in the next 10 years. And a lot of that will hinge on the result of the election and whether whoever wins can take advantage of of those positions. So Sholto, tell us a little bit about, a little bit more about Indonesia's political landscape. Most of our listeners will be unfamiliar with the political system there. Just give us the lay of the land, tell us what posts are up for grabs in this election, and then uh, fill us in on, on who's running. 
Well, I think there's something like up to 20,000 posts up for grabs at almost every level, presidency, vice presidency, national leg- legislature, local legislatures. But naturally enough, most of the focus, certainly internationally, is, is on the, the top positions. And uh, maybe I, I might just go through the, the three main candidates. The person to beat at the moment is Prabo Subianto. Now, he's a real veteran politician. He stood against Jokowi twice for the uh, presidency at the last two times. He also stood for the vice presidency before that. He was a special forces general in the 1990s, and he was formerly the son-in-law of um, Suharto, who was Indonesia's long-term um, authoritarian leader for 30 years um, until the late 1990s. In the past, he was viewed as being really quite aggressive, almost as though he felt the presidency was naturally his, that he should be president. But he's adopted a very different persona recently, almost just like this kind of cuddly grandpa figure. He does these little dances at the podiums. And he's really softened his image. He's, he's very clever. He's one of a lot of people over. Um, also, what he has going for him in, in terms of that image in, over the last few years is that after the last presidential election, which he lost, and he wasn't a particularly good loser either time, actually, um, but then he did accept that Jokowi had won, and he accepted the position of Minister of Defence underneath Jokowi. And I think uh, a lot of people were impressed by that idea of national reconciliation that he lost, but he still wanted to serve. That comes across well. Um, there are other people who weren't uh, Prabowo supporters in the past who say that he's been changed by the experience being part of the Jokowi administration. Now, he is close to 50%, but he's not at 50%. And if he doesn't win 50% in the February, the forthcoming February election, they will then go into a runoff election in June, where there will only be two candidates. But he's close to 50%. Now, the other two are both former governors. There's Anis Basradan, who's a former governor of Jakarta, also a former minister, also a former speechwriter for Jokowi. He's going very much on a, he talks about the principle of equality, anti-corruption, freedom of expression. He's been holding these events called Challenge Anis, where people can just ask him anything. He does come across well to a lot of people. He appeals particularly to liberals and intellectuals, which aren't they, they tend to be a constituency which is overrepresented in international media. For me personally, I think his approach seems a little bit too academic, but that's only my own perspective. He has a history of coming from behind the polls and then actually winning jobs in the past. But he's on in the early 20s in the polls, and so is Ganja Pranowo, the other candidate. He's a former governor of central Java. Uh, very impressive guy. Although he's in his mid-50s, he's quite youthful looking, very presentable. One reporter was filming with him and they went running together. He's going on the, the, the idea of unity in, in this vast country of 17,000 islands. And for instance, paying a visit to the province of, of Papua, which is next to Papua New Guinea. And, and it's a place which it's always been difficulty in terms of integrating into Indonesia as a whole. He doesn't come from a particularly wealthy background. He's been very big on development issues. If he doesn't win this time, I think he's a very interesting candidate for the future. And he's marking his card very well for that. I just want to go back to Prabowo Subianto for a minute, because one of the dramas in this election was the fact that his running mate is the 36-year-old Gibran Rakabuming Rama, who's, of course, Jokowi's eldest son. Now, he initially wasn't eligible to run because he's under the age of 40, but the Constitutional Court ruled that he could because he'd previously been elected to public office. How much was his entry onto the ticket deciding factor in the course of this election? I think it's interesting. And and there are both positives and negatives for it. It didn't really look very good the way that he was allowed, allowed to stand, even though he's under 40. And the constitutional court judge who ruled that he could stand happened to be his uncle, Jacoby's brother-in-law. I believe he had to resign from his position afterwards. Um, So that's not going to go down well with some people. I think there are some people who, some voters, I've seen vox pops where some voters have said that they think he's just a bit too young. On the other hand, what it does do is 
Jokowi hasn't, I don't believe that Jokowi has actually come out and said absolutely clearly, I'm supporting Pro Boa. But now everyone believes that he is supporting Pro Boa. And of course, having his son on the ticket as, as vice president just underlines that even more. And uh, Jokowi still got stratospheric uh, approval ratings. And Prabo is very much running, he stressed this again and again, and, and so is Gibran, that they're running as the continuity ticket. So I think overall, it's positive for Prabo. Yeah, Monica, I just want to turn to you for a minute, because again, one of the striking things about Gibran is his age. And actually, perhaps that's very reflective of Indonesia, where, as Sholto mentioned, about half of the registered voters are under 30. The voting age actually in Indonesia, it, it's interesting, it's actually 17, whereas in, in much of the world it's 18. So how big of a role are young people playing in this election and, and how important are the stakes uh, for them? Yeah, I think Gen Z and those who might be voting for the first time, plus the millennial voters constitute more than 50%. I believe it's like around 56% of eligible voters for the upcoming elections, right? It's obviously significant. In regards to like putting Gibran as the running mate of Prabowo, I think, of course, like there are factors, they're both uh, positive and negative factors for putting Gibran as the running mate for Prabowo, whether or not it actually is a positive factor or a negative factor. It looks like it's, of course, it's positive because Prabowo's rating has been really high. As Sholto mentioned, it's like around 50, even the latest survey, but by one poll survey already indicated it's already passing 50%, right? With the margin of error at about like 49 to 54, right? But if you follow the news in recent week, right, there's been huge protest among academics across Indonesia. Around 30 campuses have already made statement of the demogra- uh, demo- democratic backsliding, wanted President Jokowi to make to, to not take side, but also to, they were saying basically to go back to the right track, right? And even, and more recently, starting from last weekend, I believe, but it's heating up very quickly. Students now started to protest as well, including on the street, right? So now at the moment, Indonesians are watching how the government will control student protests because history shows that when students are already on the street, then history is in the making. And I think the, 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 the protests and movement by academics, both professors and and students, was triggered by Jokowi's statement that a president could actually campaign, uh, is allowed to campaign and allowed to take sides, right? But later on, there was a statement that says it actually is, uh, it's actually only allowed if a president is contesting in the next election, right? But to, to campaign and to take side, especially when his own son is one of the contenders that of course, for Indonesians, for many Indonesians, that's something that could be seen as not fair, right? So that that I think from that point on, we see a lot of massive process across campuses in Indonesia as now students as well. So let's see. Indonesia is very diverse. As Sholto already mentioned, when you pitch something that is too academics, then that might not resonate with many other Indonesians that are not really in the academic field. And my my own uh, analysis and, and surveys, my institute's uh, analysis and survey shows that less than 50% of Indonesians, this is a nationally representative survey, uh, shows that less than 50% of Indonesians actually heard about the constitutional court ruling. That survey uh, was conducted in November 2023. And even less than that, actually believe that uh, that kind of decision, especially having your own uncle as the judge in a constitutional ruling, was wrong. Although we who sit in big cities or who follows the news very closely might think that this is something that is is troubling, right? But actually, if you take an average Indonesians, then that news might not even be heard. Right. And even less so that people actually believe 
that there is something wrong with the uh, candidacy of the president's son. Monica, I just want to talk about an, another issue of concern for young people, not just in Indonesia, but all over the world, which is the, the country's economic future. Of course, Indonesia has grand ambitions. It wants to join the OECD. It wants to become a top five economy. It wants to become essentially a developed country. But of course, the average monthly wage is still only about $200 in Indonesia. So can any of the parties or candidates really take Indonesia to a place where it can be considered an economic superpower? So I'm making my assessment, right, based on their promises. Of course, from promises to implementation, that's another story, right? Let me go back a little bit of talking about like what I think President Jokowi has achieved very well and what the next president could continue in terms of economic reforms. I think President Jokowi has successfully achieved, among many other things, is on infrastructure development. As Indonesians, for the first time, I get to take the high-speed uh, train uh, from Jakarta to Bandung, and I can go to any remote regions in Indonesia now quite easily. There are like airports in many uh, remote regions in Indonesia, and there's a toll road ac across Java and other islands as well, right? So definitely, we can see that there's this progress and improvement for the first time, for the longest time. This is very much like an overdue development for Indonesia. But what we cannot see that I think the next government should, should accelerate uh, when it comes to reforms, it's the things that we, can, uh, we, we don't see. It's the soft infrastructure, it's institutions, right? Uh, corruption eradications. You can read that Indonesia's uh, corruption index has been declining since uh, the second term of Jokowi, right? And with the uh, change in the uh, uh, Corruption Eradication Commission's law uh, and the appointment of an active police general as the head of the Corruption, uh, uh, corruption Eradication Commission, and also now the violations to the Constitutional Court uh, law, right? And an economy is not only based on infrastructure development. It's not only based on logistics or hard infrastructure, but mostly on mostly the economy very much needs quality institutions. So I think that that's very important. And I, I hope and I think Indonesia's decisions to try to be a member, full member of OECD, I think is a really a good decision because in because membership to international organizations like OECD, you know, WTO, that could help Indonesia make difficult domestic reforms that it might not be able to do by itself. Shota, you've written before for the National about the decision to relocate Indonesia's capital from Jakarta to Borneo. Could you just tell us a little bit about the implications of that? And does that it's a huge project to move the capital of the entire country? Is that factoring at all in this election? What are the different candidates saying about it? Well, Prabowo is very in favor of it, and so is Ganja. I think Anis, I'm not sure he's actually said that he would actually stop it, but he clearly doesn't support it. It's something that's been talked about for years and years, and it's perfectly obvious why. Jakarta is a, is a lovely city. It's wonderful to go there, but firstly, it's sinking. Secondly, it is a, a byword for congested traffic in the region. It's just not, it's, it's just terrible. So there are, there's clearly a reason for, for it to happen. It's not the first time it's happened in the region. Malaysia moved its administrative capital from Kuala Lumpur to a new city called Putrajaya, albeit not very far away from KL, only about half an hour away. They did it in Myanmar as well. They built Naypyidaw, uh, moved the capital there from uh, Yangon. That was for slightly inscrutable reasons. Some people thought that it was the military wanted to ensconce themselves away on their own somewhere they'd be completely safe. One of the reasons, why, I guess, one can see why moving to uh, the capital city, to Nusantara, to Borneo, uh, is partly to counter this long-time complaint that everything is too Java-centric in Indonesia. And it's time that other parts of this massive archipelago Things are centered there much more. At this point, for them not to go ahead with it, there are clearly pretty large sunk costs. A lot of work has been done. 
I would guess from what he's saying that if Anis Bazbidan is elected, maybe things will stop. They'll just say, well, we've built a, we'll build a small little town here or something like that. Under the other two, certainly the promise has been that it will go ahead. It's just, I think it's supposed to be as green a city as is possible. I'm not saying take that with a pinch of salt, but I think when that there are some environmentalists who are com- complaining about building this city in Borneo. Of course, it's the very nature of the island of Borneo that if you build a big city, you're almost inevitably going to have to clear rainforests. The other side of that is what it can do in terms of development for the people of the island. And I've heard of people who, who've been involved in development projects in Borneo before, people who are from the island, say, oh, some of these NGOs from abroad, they just want people to stay living in the in as a historical museum. So long as the development is done sustainably and equitably, then it can be very good for for Borneo, for the people there, which is an enormous island. Yeah, and I find it interesting that big mega projects like this are generally seen, not in this case perhaps, but generally in the world as these kind of white elephant sort of projects. And so I find it interesting that it's supported by Ganjar Pranowo, who's coming out in this election as the kind of the man of the people. Does that indicate that there is just broad ranging popular support for this effort? Monica, what do you think, generally speaking, what what do you think about the importance of this capital move for, for the country's economic prosperity, but also just in terms of what actual Indonesians on the ground really think? I think it's like with some other policies, like downstream policies, right? I think the spirit is good in regards to downstream policy value addition, right? And in regards to moving the capital city, it's to save uh Jakarta and also to have a better uh, capital city that is not sinking, that is not jam, and so on and so forth. But uh, first of all, I would like to just highlight that it's not only moving capital city, it's building capital city. There's a big difference, right? Jokowi could have moved to Balikpapan, for example, or some other cities in, in Java. But this is completely different. It's building a capital city out of nowhere in the forest where trees would have to be uh, cut down. There's uh, and dam has to be built. And even if we're talking about like uh, construction materials to, to build the, the city, to build the buildings, they have to be shipped through rivers which dry up during like El Nino season, right? People have to People have to fly from Jakarta. And there are also some, this millennial group, a very progressive millennial group, it's called Bijak Mamili, basically trying to help first-time voters, trying to help young voters to, to vote wisely based on policies of each candidate and also political parties, right? What they found also was that actually the soil there was not strong enough actually to be uh, to build big building, right? And also they found out that once it becomes a capital city, they will not be local, locally elected leader. It will be governed from the central government. So the questions again on democracy. I think again, what, how Indonesians feel, I think the spirit is good. Yes, we want to be less Jeffa centric in terms of economic development. We want to save Jakarta from from sinking and jam and pollutions and so on and so forth and have a better capital city for Indonesia. But again, first the process and also other considerations and the, the selections of the location, I think, can be questioned. Yeah. And it, it's interesting when you talk about Jakarta centrism, it, it kind of reminded me of another sort of identity kind of polarizing issue uh, that Sholto, I wanted to ask you about, which is Anis Baswedan. A lot of people say that have accused him of playing identity politics when he ran for governor of Jakarta in 2017. His rival was um, accused of blasphemy and locked up. And now his vice presidential candidate, Mohamed Iskandar, is the head of the largest Muslim political party. Do you think identity politics are playing a big role in this election? Or is that kind of a thing of the past in Indonesia? I hope it's not playing too big a role because it's it's a terrible thing to, to bring into politics, actually. And we see it happening in Malaysia as well. And 
I will just say from my perspective here in Malaysia, we thought that Indonesia was much freer of it. I'll tell you the reason why, is that in Malaysia, over half the population is Muslim. So in a way, there's always, it's always tempting for politicians to go for, for that crucial portion of the Muslim vote. Whereas because Muslims make up, I think it's about 85% of the population in Indonesia, it feels as though there's less need for people to be sensitive about it or to feel that Muslims are under threat in any way. How can you possibly be under threat when you make up such an overwhelming majority? Uh, Anis's rival in the Jakarta election, Ahok, I believe he actually went to jail. It was really a it, it was unpleasant to behold. I, mean, I feel it was not a good period of Indonesian politics. And he was treated very harshly for, I think he quoted one verse in the Quran, and, and he wasn't joking about it, but he didn't, mean to, he didn't mean to be offensive. That was very clear. And I think what was more shocking to see, certainly externally as well, was that he had been Jokowi's deputy when Jokowi was governor of Jakarta. Uh, and even that couldn't seem to protect him in any way. So I, I hope that Anis isn't going to play that card too much. It's always there in, in sort of one shape or, form, shape or form. Monica, you, you can remind me which election it was, but one of the elections that Jokowi stood, he felt the need to go and perform Umrah in, in Mecca, I think in the campaign, just to remind people that he was a good practicing Muslim. The, the hope has been that Indonesia is genuinely diverse enough and genuinely plural enough that, that nobody needs to make this an issue. So that's really more of a personal, I'm, I'm really hoping it's not going to be a, an issue. But the last question that I want to ask uh, to both of you, um, but we'll start, we'll start with Sholto and then we'll end with Monica, is as you both started by saying, Prabowo is considered the favored candidate. He's also the continuity candidate. So I just want to ask you, kind of what does that say about uh, where Indonesia is now and where it's headed if a majority of the, elect of the electorate seems to want to continue on the current path rather than in other elections where it's, it's all about shaking things up and changing. Sholdo? Yeah, well, I think it's, as I say, you look at uh, Jokowi's approval rating, it's still incredibly high. I think a lot of people would feel that, no, not everything was perfect, but they look at where they were 10 years ago and, and where they are now. And they see a lot to be impressed by. Monica was talking about all the infrastructure development. And it's interesting that Jakarta Bandung uh, Railway, that was part of the Belt and Road Initiative with China, wasn't it? And it's an ex example. Maybe that can be seen as, oh, lots of people are criticizing the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, from China. But here we see how clever our president has been. He's done this initiative with China, and we've got this great new railway line. And there's been impressive growth over the period of his presidency. And I think a lot of voters in Southeast Asia, they don't expect their leaders to be perfect. And they don't expect, they're so used to issues like corruption, that when it's still there, for a lot of people, it's not necessarily too shocking. It's just, it's, it's a, a normal part of life. So if he hasn't totally cleared all that up, that doesn't mean that people are giving him a free pass on that, but they may not feel that, they don't feel that, if they don't feel that their lives have got worse, if they think in general that the direction has been good, that to an extent that they worry about or are aware of world opinion, they would know that he has generally been perceived of pretty well around the world. He's also stood up for Indonesia at various times. Like I, I remember there was a, a case of some people on, I think Australians who were on death row. And a whole lot of outsiders were saying, oh, no, you can't put forward the death penalty. And he just, he, he wouldn't be told by other countries what to do. So I, I would guess that it, it, what it would show is that most Indonesians maybe are, are pretty happy with how things are going. And so they're very happy for it to continue. Monica, would you agree with that? Uh, I slightly disagree with that in a sense that I think we have to see Jokowi's first and second administration differently, right? I think this is already the second time that I feel Indonesia is having this second term curse, both for SBY and for Jokowi as, as an academic and observer, right? Together with some other policy observers. 
we were hoping during the SPY second term that he would make even a, a bolder sort of like reforms because he cannot be elected. So he can make reforms that are not popular, uh, such as uh, such as facing out from uh, subsidies that go to the middle class and to the rich, right? But what happened was basically he was trying to consolidate his power, reshuffling his cabinet, right? And later on, he was trying to put his son to continue the president. And again, this is what happened to Jokowi. We thought that second term, yes, first term, he was very successful in terms of forming infrastructure development, social assistance, among, among other things. And second term, the plan was for him to, to make progress in terms of institutional reforms, right? So the first term was like hard infrastructure, second term was soft infrastructure. But again, that happened again. He was trying to consolidate power, bringing in Prabowo, his main opponent, to the cabinet, right? And now he, I think he has 80% of coalitions of parliament. So his approval rating, in my view, he has a very high appro- approval rating, like 75, 80%. I think part of it is because of his success in the first term. This is what makes a lot of people worried. Because, yes, he started in, in the right trajectory, but then in the second term, he's sort of like going off track. That's what like academics around the world have been saying, Jokowi, please go back to the right track again. Because you're seeing it's like he's going off track already. So the trend, the trend is not, in my views, if it continues, it's not going to the right direction. Unless this is corrected under like Prabowo if he wins even though he says like continuity. Don't you think then you might have a situation where the continuity with Prabowo um, is really a, a continuity of the highlights of Jokowi's presidency, as you mentioned, and, and then Prabowo will have a kind of first term scenario where he has to prove himself and, and he continues kind of the better parts of the Jokowi presidency. So I think right now people buy buys into his election campaign about continuity, especially this has been like an advantage to him, right? And this is part of the reason he, he agrees for Gibran to be the, the pairing mate, right? Because of Jokowi's high approval rating. But the question is, this is, was first raised by political scientist Marcus Meitzer at Australian National University in one of his podcasts, uh, is that whether or not after Jokowi steps down as a president, and Prabowo becomes a new president, whether or not he will continue to listen to Jokowi, right? So this is Jokowi's risk, actually. It's actually riskier for him to side with Prabowo than to side with PDIP, who says that they will not listen to Jokowi anymore when he steps down. But who can guarantee that actually Prabowo will listen to Jokowi after Jokowi becomes a nobody, right? Uh, or like former president, of course. So now people think that, yeah, continuation of his policies, right? Uh, social assistance, uh, infrastructure development, but this is, this is not guaranteed in my view. And as, as we've seen with the current vice uh, president, he is nowhere in the policy making, not even in media, right? So pri- vice president doesn't guarantee anything that he can have influence in the policy. That's all from us for this episode of the Year of Elections. Special thanks to our guests, Monica Wiharja and Sholto Burns. This episode was produced by Arthur Edison and Doa Farid. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can find us on your favorite podcast platform and hit subscribe. And join us next week when we'll be looking at the upcoming elections in Iran. 